Wasn't that amazing? What a beautiful place we call our home. But then when we think a bit more about it, when we think of the impact of humanity upon this planet, we have to admit we've made a bit of a mess of it. The destruction of this planet, of the rainforest, the pollution, the conflicts and wars, we need help. This blue dot contains all the beauty of creation, yet all the turmoil of humanity. And it's set within a vast universe, and it is big. One of the most famous photographs of planet Earth was taken by the Apollo 17 mission. People saw planet Earth from space. This tiny blue dot in the midst of a vast universe. And just to give you a bit of the scale of that universe, on the 20th of August 1977, the space probe Voyager 2 was launched to observe and transmit data from space. It traveled at 90,000 miles an hour. And 12 years later, it reached the planet Neptune, which is 2,700 million miles away from the Earth. And then 200,000 million miles away, Voyager 2 left our solar system and won't come within another star like our sun for 958,000 years. Imagine that. And in our galaxy, there are 100,000 million stars. And our galaxy is just one of 100,000 million galaxies in the known universe. And then when we read the Bible in Genesis chapter 1, there's a throwaway line that says, and God made the stars too. Our sun, one of those stars, is one of billions and billions in the universe. The sun is like a raging ball of fire, 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It's like many nuclear bombs just going off at the same time. And it takes eight minutes for the light of the sun to travel to planet Earth. If the Earth was any nearer the sun, we would all burn up. If we were any further away from the sun, we would all freeze. We are just in the right place, perfectly made. And this God who made the heavens and earth is the one who calls us into relationship with him. God is both transcendent and imminent. He is far greater and more powerful than the universe, yet he is there for us when we pray. The universe is so vast in relation to all that it contains that someone has compared it to a building 20 miles high, 20 miles long, 20 miles wide, containing a single grain of sand. The Bible says that since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen so that we are without excuse. That's from Romans chapter one, verse 20. For those with eyes to see, God's handiwork is on display. In John's gospel, chapter one, it says this. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not overcome it, has not understood it. Creation has a designer label, made by God. God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I love this story that I heard many years ago of a Christian scientist who worked in a university. And in his office, he had the most beautiful model of the solar system, the sun and the planets that were evolved around it, all made of beautiful gemstones. 
One of his colleagues, one of his best friends in the university, also was a professor there, but he was an atheist. And one day, the atheist asked his friend, I just love that model you've got in your office. Who made it for you? Tongue in cheek, he replied to his friend, well, nobody. One day, the door just slammed really hard, and it was just there. They laughed together. He knew what his friend was getting at. And his friend pushed it a bit further and asked the atheist, so if you know that this simple model is made by someone, has a creator, why do you find it so hard to believe that the real thing, this amazing universe that we live in, doesn't have a creator? The design of the universe is so amazing. But not only that, we human beings are amazing. You are amazing. God says so and he should know. On average, our hearts pump over a thousand gallons of blood a day. Roughly over 55 million gallons in an average lifetime. It never rests. It always beats, beating 2.5 billion times in an average lifetime. Our lungs contain a thousand miles of capillaries. The process of exchanging oxygen for carbon dioxide is so complicated that Dr. John Medina of Washington University says, it is more difficult to exchange O2 for CO2 than for a man shot out of a cannon to carve the Lord's Prayer on the head of a pin as he passes by. And our DNA contains 2,000 genes per chromosome. 1.8 meters of DNA are folded into each cell nucleus. A cell nucleus is six microns long. This is like putting 30 miles of fishing line into a cherry stone. And it's not just stuffed in, it's folded in. Folded one way, it becomes a skin cell. Folded another way, a liver cell. And to write the information in one cell would take 300 volumes, each 500 pages thick. And the human body contains enough DNA that if it were stretched out, it would circle the sun 260 times. Wow. Again, King David writes a psalm about this. He says, God, you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. So if God is so big and so great, why is he bothered about us? And how can we have a relationship with him? Well, the Bible says we can because he loves us and he made us for relationship with him. And that relationship got spoilt by our sin are turning away from him. But God has come in Jesus to open up that relationship once again, to deal with the problem of sin and to restore us to relationship with himself. And how can we have that relationship? Well, through prayer. I wonder what comes to your mind when I mention prayer. Surveys have shown that three quarters of the population of sceptical, secular Britain admit to praying at least once a week. It doesn't say who they pray to or what they ask for, but they're seeking divine help of some kind. I guess it would be an emergency break glass kind of prayer. You know the kind of prayer I mean. Help! There was a story of a man who was walking along a cliff. He was walking along the path when suddenly his foot slipped and he stumbled over the edge of the cliff and he fell down and he grasped hold of a branch that was growing out of the cliff and he was left dangling there. In desperation, he cried out to God, God, if you're there, help me. To his surprise, he heard a voice responding, Yes, I'm here. Let go of the branch. Trust me. After a moment's silence, he shouted out again. Is there anyone else up there who can help me? 
Help is the most prayed prayer ever. And so often when we ask for God's help, it comes in one way or another, but then gets dismissed as a coincidence. But I find it so amazing that so many coincidences happen when we pray. But real prayer is not just for emergencies. It's for every day. It's for life. It's for a relationship with God. So what is prayer? Prayer is the main way we open, grow and maintain a relationship with God. Jesus said, when you pray, talk to your heavenly Father. So what is prayer and what isn't prayer? Well, it's a relationship and not a ritual. It's not religious. In fact, Jesus was most critical of the religious people who made prayer more about themselves than actually talking to God. It's not a special language that only a few can master. And it's not a shopping list either. A mother overheard her young son praying one day. And if you give me a bike, Lord, I'll be good for a whole week. And she interrupted him and said that it was no good trying to bargain with God like that. He didn't answer prayers like that. A few days later, she overheard him again. God, and if you give me a bike, I'll be good for three weeks. Again, she interrupted and said, I thought I told you God doesn't respond to prayers like that. A few days later, the mother was cleaning the house when she discovered right at the bottom of the airing cupboard the little statue of Madonna that used to stand on the sideboard. And there on the sideboard was a little note written by her son. It said, OK, God, if you ever want to see your mother again, how about that bike? Prayer is not about demanding things. It is not about bringing a shopping list to God. It is a matter of relationship. And we know that in any relationship, communication is the key. Any relationship thrives on communication and struggles when communication breaks down. That's why I believe that prayer is one of the most important activities of our lives. Because it's the main way we develop a relationship with God, made possible through Jesus Christ. And if you love somebody, naturally you'll want to spend time with them and communicate with them. And prayer is just talking to God. So natural, anyone can do it. In fact, children find it easier to pray because they don't have all the hang-ups that we adults have. Someone once said that real prayer is not about gritting our teeth, but about falling in love with God. After all, we're speaking to God, the one who's revealed his love for us when he died on the cross for us, who can't love us any more than he does and longs for us to come to relationship with him. In other words, prayer is not a chore, but a delight, a privilege. We can talk to the maker of heaven and earth and know that he hears us. The Dean of Chester once wrote about prayer. He said, prayer is not simply seeking divine help and intervention. It has more to do with tuning into God's will and offering him adoration, confession, thanksgiving and supplication. It's a great pattern for prayer. But I like that idea of tuning into God's will. When I was growing up as a teenager, I used to take a radio to bed with me. You remember those kind of radios. You had to turn a dial to get it tuned into the right station. And in a way, prayer is like tuning in to God, taking all the other noises out and focusing on that relationship with God. And Christian prayer is unique in that it involves the Trinity, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Christian prayer is to our Father in heaven. Do you recognize that phrase, our Father in heaven? Jesus was once asked by his disciples that he teach them how to pray because they had seen something in Jesus so natural, so real, so intimate, 
that they wanted to know about that relationship. And Jesus taught them a prayer, a model prayer. Our Father in heaven, you can call God your Father. Jesus said that his Father was our Father too. And the word that Jesus used was an intimate word. Abba, Daddy, or Dear Father. And that word was brought home to me on one of my first visits to the Holy Land. I was in Jerusalem, and one night we had some free time, so I was walking on the walls of Jerusalem, and I noticed a little girl that was playing on the top of a courtyard of a cafe. And there were stairs going up to the courtyard on either side. And I noticed her because she was probably the same age as my daughter back home. And then suddenly she cried out, Abba! And from the top step of the stairs, she flung herself into the arms of her father. Abba! She cried. And it suddenly came home to me. This is what Jesus says. We can call God our Abba Father. In the Gospels, Jesus prays 21 times. We have 21 recorded prayers of Jesus. And in 20 of them, he begins those prayers with Father. The fatherhood of God means we have access. We're invited. We're accepted. We're welcome. And we have attention. We are heard. Above it all, it means we have a heavenly father who loves us and who cares for us and wants to know us more. Now I'm a father and being a father has been one of the greatest privileges of my life. And it has shown me something of God's love. I remember when my daughter was born, she hadn't done anything, said anything, yet I loved her with all my heart because she was mine. And I think God sees us like that too. It would break my heart if my daughter suddenly said she didn't want to speak to me or didn't want to have anything to do with me. And I think in the same way, it must break God's heart when we say the same things to him. One of the most famous stories that Jesus told, one of the parables, is about a father. It's often called the story of the prodigal son or the lost son, but I think it should be called the parable of the loving father. It's in Luke chapter 15. I want to read it to you. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger son said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate. So the father divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and he set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the land and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him into his fields to feed the, pig, feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with what the pigs were eating but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him and ran out to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to the father, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Jesus says that's how our heavenly father 
feels about us. He's just longing for us to turn around. He's looking out for us. He wants us to come home. And we can through his son, Jesus. Christian prayer is through the son. The apostle Paul says we have access to our heavenly father through Jesus. It's only because of Jesus that we know that we have a heavenly father who loves us. Now, of course, anyone can pray, but it's only Jesus who can introduce us to a relationship with God as our Father. We gain access through Jesus. It's not about what you know. It's about who you know. This story explains that. During the American Civil War, as a result of a family tragedy, a soldier was granted permission to seek a hearing from the president. He wanted to, uh, to receive exemption from military service. However, when he arrived at the White House, he was refused entry and sent away. He went and sat in a nearby park. A young boy came across him and saw how unhappy he was. And the soldier found himself telling the young boy the whole story. Eventually, the boy said, why don't you come with me? He led the dejected soldier back to the White House. They went through the security. No one stopped them. The soldier was amazed. And finally, they came to the presidential office and without knocking, the young boy opened the door and walked straight in. Abraham Lincoln, standing there, turned from his conversation with the Secretary of State and said, what can I do for you, son? The son said, Dad, this soldier needs to speak to you. The soldier had access to the president through the son. In an even more amazing way, we have access to God through Jesus, the son. Christian prayer is distinctive. It is Trinitarian. St. Paul writes, through him, Jesus, we have access to the Father by the Holy Spirit. That's why prayer is such an immense privilege. We're able to speak to God, the creator of the universe, as our heavenly Father. You can come to him through Jesus, the man who is God, our Lord, our King. And prayer is inspired by the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who reveals the truth of Jesus to our hearts. It is the Holy Spirit who develops that relationship. The Holy Spirit is God at his closest to us. Jesus' promise, I will always be with you. I will never leave you. And he promised that we would be filled with his Holy Spirit. Prayer at its heart is communication with God. And sometimes we do find it hard to pray. We don't know how to pray. We don't know what to pray. But God never leaves us. And his Holy Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. The Bible says that the Spirit searches our hearts and intercedes for us. And in prayer, we can grow into a deeper and deeper relationship with God. We can go deeper and deeper in prayer. Prayer is not me asking God into my world to serve me. But you could say that prayer is God asking us into his world to serve his purposes. I think that is part of the frustration sometimes people have with prayer. They don't quite understand that it's about a relationship. We know that that's the real purpose of prayer, not just to draw up a list of requests, but as we develop in prayer with God, it can mean wrestling with big issues, concerns, able to ask God for his help and intervention. What a privilege to share our heart with the heavenly Father who loves us. We can intercede for a lost and broken world. I believe it is a universal truth that coincidences happen when we pray. Is prayer a last resort or a first resource? Fundamentally, it is the way we develop our relationship with God. And we can pray anywhere at any time. In fact, 
uh, a theologian, Lancelot Andrews, who lived in the 16th century. After he died, a private notebook on prayer was discovered and published. In it, there were two little lists at the front. First, he wrote a list of the times of prayer that he'd found in the Bible. Pray always, without ceasing, at all times, in the evening, in the morning, at noon, before the break of day, at the third hour, at the sixth hour, at the ninth hour, in the evening, at night and at midnight. Basically, it means we can pray at any time. And the next list that he wrote was the places of prayer that he found in the Bible, in the assembly, in the congregation, on your own, in an upper room, on a housetop, in a temple, on the seashore, in the garden, on their beds, in the desert place, in every place. Basically, we can pray anywhere. There's no limit to the times, places, and different ways in which we can pray. But prayer changes things, it changes us, and it changes situations. So how can we start to pray if we've never prayed before? Well, we can just begin to talk to God. I remember when I first became a Christian, I wrote down a list of things that I wanted to pray for. But because I got a bit naturally lazy with it, I would just go through the list. And I remember having that sense of God speaking to me about that list. And he said, I know the list, Philip, but tell me what's on your heart. And that's when I really began to develop that relationship with God. He also gave us that amazing pattern of prayer, the Lord's Prayer. It's a masterclass in prayer. It's not something that we just reel off, but we can take a line at a time and fill in with our own words. Our Father, this is an amazing privilege that we can call God our Father, who is in heaven. He is the creator of all things. Thank him for his amazing creation. Holy is your name. He deserves our worship. Your kingdom come, your will be done is just submitting to his rule and reign in our lives, but also praying that he might have his way in situations and circumstances. Give us today our daily bread. We can ask for the very small things or the biggest of things and pray for those who have little of those things and forgive us our sins, to confess our sins, to keep short accounts with God and to forgive others who have hurt us, to keep soft hearts, not to harbour bitterness or unforgiveness. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. To pray for God's strength for all that we face in our lives. What an amazing pattern of prayer that Jesus gave us. When can we pray? Anytime. Where can we pray? Any place. At the heart of prayer is a relationship with God. If you've never prayed before, why not this week give it a go? If you've stopped praying for whatever reason, why not start again? I know that God wants to hear from you. Thank you for listening. God bless you.